So I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the Historical Perspectives on Poverty webinar. We're excited that you're able to participate today in our first in a series on conversations about poverty with Dr. Stephen Pimpere. Stephen is joining us today from New York, and I'm hosting the webinar, webinar here from Portland, Oregon. And my colleague, Nikki Martin, is joining me and also helping out with tech support. So thanks again to everyone who made this possible. Let's go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. As I mentioned, the phones are muted to minimize background noise. If you have any questions or would like to share something, please type your questions into the chat panel and send them to all participants at any point throughout the presentation. Stephen will get to your questions when he's at a good stopping point. And as I mentioned before, there will be time at the end to ask questions for folks that are just on the phone. We'll also be using a whiteboard during the presentation today. And you can use the annotation tools that are shown here. Here's a sample of them. And they're also available at the top of your screen right here. I'm drawing an arrow. So when we get to the whiteboard, you can use the T tool or the pencil if you want to draw um, maybe something with your brainstormed idea. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the presentation to Stephen and get us started. Take it away, Stephen. Terrific. Thank you, Amy. Um, Amy, can you hear me? And we assume everybody else can? We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Terrific. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm glad to see so many of you here. Um, and you may be hearing a little beep in the background, and that will be others who are joining us. Um, and I'm very glad to be here myself. And if um, I can, why don't we start just by quickly turning our attention to what it is that we've identified as some learning objectives for today's discussion. Um, so if we could move on to that slide and take a look. Um, and as you'll see shortly, that should be popping up. There we go. Um, so let me just go over those briefly. Right? So first, what we'd like to do is very simply describe and present to you some common views about people living in poverty and to identify three common explanations that are often used about why it is that people are poor and what it is that I mean by that will become evident in, in very short order. We then also like to um, offer the means to describe a bit of the experience of poverty as it's viewed by poor Americans themselves. To then, with a little luck, be able to compare those perspectives from people experiencing poverty and those not in poverty, and perhaps have you all begin an effort to offer some of your own hypotheses about why those, hypo why those perspectives might differ. And then finally, um, to be able to start a process of evaluating how this kind of thinking affects your own views or perhaps challenges any pre preconceptions that you might have had. So as you can see from that, we've, we've, we've set up a fairly ambitious set of goals today. But ultimately, what it is that we most hope to achieve is, I think, fairly simple. And that is to help you all to get a bit of a sense of how different people have talked about poverty over time. And to do that, we'll principally compare what are some elite opinions about poverty and need with some thoughts from people who are actually experiencing it. And as you'll see, um, we'll do that with direct quotation from various people. And in those instances, I'm going to read those quotes out loud so that you all don't feel as if you have to scramble to read what's on your screen. So you can read along with me if you'd like, or maybe you'd rather close your eyes and simply listen. And it's important, we think, to hear the voices of poor people, since so often, instead, we hear only the voices of other people talking about them, like this. So let's begin here with this short quote from novelist Edith Wharton from um, The House of Mirth, an absolutely terrific book you should all read in your copious free time. Um, and Wharton wrote as follows, affluence unless stimulated by a keen imagination, forms but the vaguest notion of the practical strain of poverty. Let's do that one more time. Affluence, unless stimulated by a keen imagination, forms but the vaguest notion of the practical strain of poverty. 
one of the things that we'd like to do today is to help you to get into the habit of considering more carefully the range of reasons that people might be in need of assistance from government or from nonprofit agencies. That is, to put understanding that practical strain of poverty to the front of your thinking, or said maybe even more prosaically, to put yourself in other people's shoes. And I think Wharton's observation here is a good one to keep in mind. So with that, <coughs> pardon me. Um, so Amy's going to open up a whiteboard, and I'm going to turn back to her for a moment just to have her offer a couple of, of, of things by way of instructions. But what we'd like to do here is to have you jump in with a quick survey. And the question is simply this. What do you think the most important factors are that create poverty in the United States today? Right? That is, what are the causes of poverty? Now, some of you will remember this, some of you quite recently, from your PSO. You've been asked to weigh in on this before. But it's an important question, so we'd like to raise it here again. So, Amy, would you like to just sort of point to, to what folks need to do in case they're not entirely sure? Sure. Um, you can use this arrow tool that I've just drawn an underline under to stake your claim on the page like I've just done here. And then you can use the text tool, which is uh, right next to the arrow, to type your ideas. So go ahead and start uh, answering this question here that Stephen's put forth for the group. Right, and you know, if you've got more than one idea, throw in more than one idea. If you've got one, just name one. Um, maybe we can collectively work on naming as many as we can. You can also, if you'd rather, right, instead of putting in what you think might be a cause of poverty, put in what you think other people might think be a cause of poverty, if you'd rather. Right, so what do we have? So Robin's saying lack of education, either formal education or knowledge about resources. Good. So it's, it may have to do with what folks call a human capital approach, right, sort of developing the skills over time to, say, be more competitive or simply knowing where to go and to get assistance. Um, social capital, that's picking up on what Robin's saying, illiteracy. Um, lack of employment opportunities in rural areas. Good, that's a nice observation, right? The, the challenges that are faced by people in rural areas are different than what people in suburbia faces are different than what people um, face in cities. Generational poverty. Um, says, I think Christopher, and my screen is cutting off for some funny reason, um, bad mental health system, right? So the suggestion that perhaps there's a correlation between mental illness and poverty, and if there are insufficient resources available to treat that kind of mental illness, it, it's, it's going to make it difficult for folks to escape poverty. Um, I can't see the name there because that's sort of off the end of my screen, but someone's saying culture of poverty, which can mean different kinds of things to different people, but very often um, that's uh, uh, talking about the behavioral problems, which we're actually going to turn our attention to in a moment. Um, anybody else want to jump in? I think that some of what's going on here, I think we've got some light-colored um, writing that I may not be popping up on my screen, but let me wa watch for just another moment or so. And if anybody else wants to jump in, go ahead and do that now. Um, and I apologize. If you've written and I can't see it, it may be that you've somehow crept off the edge of my screen. Um, so I'll find a way to make it up to you later. Um, okay, so apathy, lack of being given a chance. Um, systems in place, which I'm going to guess means lack of systems in place, perhaps. Um, poverty mentality, which is um, likely related to that notion of a culture of poverty. Okay, good. So we'll see that there's um, a range of responses here, right? So now let's turn our attention, if we can move on to the next slide, Amy. Um, let's now look at a large national survey in which people across the country were asked a similar question. Um, and what we're looking at here is, is people were read the following list, right, drug abuse, med medical bills, too many jobs, et cetera, and asked if they thought that these were a major cause of poverty. Right in that left-hand column, you see people who are not poor and whether they thought that was a major cause, and people who were poor and whether they thought that was a major cause. Right, so I'm going I'm to pause and be quiet for, for maybe 15 or 20 seconds and give you an opportunity just to look through that a little bit. Okay, so... I think there are any number of interesting things going on here, and maybe toward the end, if, if, if folks want to talk about this in more depth, we can do that then. But one of the things that strikes me about this is that there, in most instances, with a couple of exceptions, 
the responses from people who aren't poor don't tend to be too terribly different than the responses from people who are poor. Um, now, one of the notable exceptions in, in this particular survey is the shortage of jobs. Right, 27% of people who were not poor thought that a shortage of jobs, oh, that's terrific, thank you, Amy, um, thought that a shortage of jobs was a, a major cause of poverty, whereas almost twice that many who were poor thought that a shortage of jobs. So that may be an instance where, where sort of the, the, the where you fit has an effect on where you stand, right, the ways in which perhaps your own perspective might alter how you view the causes of poverty. Um, but for the most part, there tends to be an awful lot of alignment, um, and we see some some overlap with, with some of the things that folks suggested here. Right? So there are lots and lots of different ways that we could start to, to formalize our thinking, to build categories about what the kinds of causes of poverty might be. And for today, what I'd like for us to do is to use this one. It's from Professor Bradley Schiller. Um, he proposes that there are three general categories, um, as you can see here, for, for how people have thought about and continue to think about why it is that people are poor. And the first one he refers to as the flawed character explanation. And here, poverty is a result of sin. It's a result of laziness, of a lack of work ethic, of, of bad choices. It's a consequence of either people doing things that they shouldn't do or not doing things that they ought to do. It's behavioral. It's very often um, shorthanded as the culture of poverty. Right? Now, the second explanation he points to, he calls the big brother explanation. We're also going to refer to this as the perverse incentives big brother explanation. And what Schiller argues is that, that these kinds of explanations suggest that it's access to government assistance that creates perverse incentives. It distorts the market, and in fact, giving people aid does more harm, ultimately, than good. So, in other words, if someone is poor and you give them cash, you reduce the chances that they will work to solve their own poverty themselves, thereby perpetuating the problem and eventually making them fully dependent on aid. Right? So that's the logic of that kind of big brother perverse incentives explanation for poverty. And fi the final category he points us toward is what he calls restricted opportunities. Right? Lack of access to education, as a number of folks pointed out, to jobs, to active discrimination that may impact people's ability. Um, somebody earlier referred to social capital, right? Those become kinds of restricted opportunities explanations that instead of pointing toward the individual behavioral or moral flaws of individuals or families, point to larger systemic structural kinds of problems that they may not have any control over. Right, so if you'll think back again to the list that we all just made, you'll see that I think, if memory serves, everything that anyone suggested we could put into one of these categories. Um, so now we're going to do a very quick poll, right, and you see it in front of you. Which of the following best explains most of the poverty that you have personally seen in your area? Right, so, so from what you have seen as a VISTA most recently, Right, which of these seems to best characterize the poverty of the people that you've encountered? Right. So, Amy, anything we need to say about how folks need to deal with the poll? Uh, just go ahead and click on your choice, and I see that answers are coming in as we speak. Uh, Stephen, just let me know when you want me to close it and publish it for the group. Okay, let's, let's not give it too terribly long. Let's give folks another maybe six, seven, eight seconds. Now, if they're just clicking the button, we'll assume that, that that'll work. Okay, so have we ended? Can we look at results? Uh, yeah, it looks like um, it's counting down and it's getting ready to publish the results now. Oh, very exciting. <laughs> so, so, so we're all just sort of collectively waiting. Okay, so you should see the published results on your screen. Wow. So, so that's that I find fascinating. Right, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that everybody else can see what it is that I'm just seeing now, right? So we've got zero people who, who thought that, that the poverty that they were, were witnessing was, was principally a consequence of flawed character. Zero people 
who thought that it was principally a consequence of, of that big brother perverse incentives kinds of explanation. Um, fully 26 out of 36, two thirds identifying restricted opportunities as the principal reason that people were in poverty. And another third um, not answering, and presumably, right, that could mean a couple of things, right? I'm gonna guess that for some people that they thought it was maybe a combination of things um, and weren't sure which of them to identify as more important than others. Um, perhaps what folks see going on, maybe they, they don't see enough going on to get a, a sense of that. Um, so, um, so sort of fold that result into the back of your head. One of the things that I think is particularly interesting about that is that, um, as we're going to see shortly, throughout American history, it is, for my money, the flawed character and the big brother perverse incentive explanation that have, by and large, dominated. So. Before we do what it is that I promised that we're going to do and turn to the voices of poor Americans themselves, I want us to take a look at some of those usual examples of how it is that people talk about poverty. Right. So let's begin um, with this rather formidable charity worker from the late 19th century, Mrs. Evans, who wrote, she actually said this in a speech, too often it will be found that the root of the evil lies in the character of the poor themselves in habits of laziness shiftlessness, intemperance, or vice, which have reduced them to an irregular and meager subsistence. Right, now this is a typical explanation, really, in a lot of ways, up until at least the progressive era, so the late 1800s, early 1900s, and this, I think it's fairly obvious, is a kind of flawed character explanation, right? Um, if we turn again, this is um, also a common refrain. This is from another charity leader um, from around the same time. This is Frederick Olney, who said that it is hardly too much to say that people do not beg because they are poor, but that they are poor because they beg, and that as long as they beg, they will stay poor. For centuries, the stream of charity has been steadily flowing, and the flood of poverty has been growing, and we have not stopped to consider that it might be merely cause and effect. So um, let's do another very quick poll, if we can load that up, Amy. Right, so, so of these, which, which kind of explanation do you think these is? I'm assuming this is going to be very straightforward for everybody, right? Is this a flawed character explanation, a big brother or perverse incentive explanation, or a restricted opportunities explanation? All right, let's get folks just another couple of sentence, seconds to, 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 to hit a button. All right, so what do we have by way of results there? Oh, it's a whole waiting uh, patiently again. for it to load the results part again. I'm so bad at anything that requires waiting impatiently, but I'll practice. It's counting down, giving everyone one last chance to vote. And oh, I see. One second remaining, so you should be seeing the poll results on your screen now. Okay, so we've got um, six or see flawed character. Um, 16 who see Big Brother, um, or 44 percent others, percentages, that's much better. Zero who see that as a restrict, uh, restricted opportunity kind of explanation, and 14 who, again, aren't sure for one reason or another and may well see a couple of things at work there. Um, I think that's all fair enough. I think that for me that more than anything is a kind of Big Brother kind of explanation, right? It's, it's saying, I mean, literally, right? It's, it's, it's people don't beg because they're poor, they're poor because they beg. And the very act of giving assistance to people without some sort of condition, presumably, is going to exacerbate their problem. Right. And I think the thing that's interesting to point out here in, in, in terms of Almi is that this isn't used often as an argument against the government intervening and offer, offering assistance to, to people who are poor or unemployed or otherwise in need, but often as a reason why sometimes even private charity should restrict the assistance they offer to people depending on the judgments they make about their deservingness. All right, so let's um, turn on to the next one. Um, and this is another, what I think is a big brother approach from what I think most people would think of as a relatively surprising source. Continued dependence upon relief induces a spiritual disintegration fundamentally destructive to the national fiber. To dole out relief in this way is to administer a narcotic a subtle destroyer of the human spirit. This federal government must and shall quit the business of relief. Right? So even Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who helped erect the very foundations of the American welfare state in the aftermath of the Great Depression, 
Even FDR believed that aid to poor people could be harmful to them. Others more recently during the debate, say over welfare reform in the 1990s, would wind up comparing welfare recipients to drug addicts and even to animals and would ultimately continue not only to refer to welfare itself as a drug, but even more recently, and if you've seen the papers in the last week or so, you see that some states have begun requiring um, recipients to take actual drug tests before they're eligible to receive aid. Right? And let's look at an even more recent expression that I think is sort of a combined flawed character and big brother argument, and this is from a prominent welfare policy analyst who wrote that one-way handouts usually hurt those they are intended to help. True charity begins by requiring responsible behavior from the beneficiary as a condition of receiving aid. True charity seeks to generate in the recipient the virtues, commitment, and self-discipline necessary for success in society, rather than passively subsidizing ever-escalating levels of social pathology. Right, and again, it's a clear suggestion that ultimately it's the moral reform of poor people that should principally occupy our attention. And finally, to show that this way of thinking is very much still part of our political culture, here's a quote from an elected official from just last year. My grandmother was not a highly educated woman, but she told me as a small child to quit feeding stray animals. You know why? Because they breed. You're facilitating the problem if you give an animal or a person ample food supply. They will reproduce, especially ones that don't think too much further than that. I don't know any better. I believe government is breeding a culture of dependency which has grown out of control. It's a flawed character kind of explanation. Again, I think mixed with this big brother perverse incentives notion, which I think if you look around and you listen to a lot of discussion about poverty and read some discussion about poverty even today, you'll find that those kinds of explanations tend to travel together. Right? The idea that poor people are to blame and that government aid will only make it worse by not letting them suffer the consequences of their behavior. So all of this, what we've just seen, are not the only ways of thinking about poverty and about poor people, obviously, and given the responses that you all have made to the survey, it seems that, that not principally, at least the way that you all understand the poverty that you're seeing um, in your areas or your communities, but they are exceptionally common, and from my perspective, accurately represent the kind of thinking that winds up dominating in most periods of American history. And in fact, I could go back 300 years and, and for pretty much any history, identify this as really a fairly dominant strain. Now notice that most of the voices that we've heard are from politicians, they're from educators, they're from, from policy analysts, they're from leaders, they are from elites. So let's turn our attention now and take a look at some other perspectives. Now, if we look at these two photographs here, um, I think probably fairly obvious to everyone, we're looking at, at some kind of restrained opportunity kind of explanation. Right? And in fact, one of the constants from throughout American history is that the kind of rhetoric that we've just seen aside, poor and unemployed people, when they have demanded anything at all, and those have been, in fact, fairly rare events, have been much more likely to demand work rather than welfare. And maybe that's not surprising since pride and dignity and self-worth, these are also things that come along with work, right? It's not just income that you get out of steady work. And people tend to value their ability to take care of themselves and their families. And, you know, truth be told, there are even some elites who have observed that the struggle is typically for work, not for welfare. And we can see that in this editorial going as far back as 1791. It is said that our poor are indolent and will not work. But give the poor a sufficient compensation for their work. Let the demand for their exertions be constant and steady, and it will soon be found that the charge of indolence is a calumny on the most destitute part of our fellow citizens. So this is, I think, part of, of the challenge of thinking about those supposed perverse incentives of welfare and assistance and aid and charity. 
some people wind up relying upon charity not as a first resort but as a last resort because they cannot get enough in wages or benefits from the work that's available to them. And again, you know, putting my historian's hat on, people historically have sought aid, whether it's public or private, either when work is simply not available, when they are sick or they're disabled and therefore unable to work, or this is very common among particularly um, women who are single parents, when they need to take care of children who are sick or disabled, or if they need to care for a sick adult. My sick parent often. All right, so now let's take a look at this next image. Right. And why don't we, um, we're going to open, uh, the chat is actually open. So why don't you um, go into to where the chat box is um, and just talk a little bit. Uh, is, this, is this picture showing us a flawed character kind of explanation, a big brother perverse incentives kind of explanation, or reduced opportunity, right? What is it that you think that's, that's going on here? Um, let's take just a couple of minutes. Type anything you'd like into the chat window. Um, Amy, is there anything you need to say to folks to make sure that they know where they need to be looking? Yes, you may need to uh, click the arrow that appears next to the chat bubble to expand your chat pane. Uh, the poll may be over it. And then be sure when you type your question that you type it for all attendees and click submit. Okay, I see, I see Ruby says reduced opportunity is what she sees going on here. Right, and I think that when you've typed in what it is that you want to type in, I think you can just hit return and that's going to send it out as long as you've in that pull down menu you've picked. We've got more. Jesse's also saying reduced opportunity. Joshua's saying reduced opportunity. Thank you. We've got a little divergence here. Rebecca's saying big brother. Um, Diana, good. Diana's offering us some explanation because it is pointing out that other forms of discrimination are also at work. Um, lack of opportunity, the lack of effective government programs. Okay, so this is this is a, this is slightly different, right? It's it's sort of it's looking at at failure of maybe interventions that might already be there. We see Big Brother and lack of opportunity, um, seeking more government assistance. Yeah, Dolly, but is is that right? Where which category does that fall into? Reduced opportunity, racism, okay. Um, interesting, right? They're not making explicit claims about race, but presumably we're seeing something about the, the racial identity of many of the partici participants there, so assuming that perhaps they're making race claims. Structural racism, they're also from Katie. Reduce opportunity and structural racism. Right, anybody else want to jump in before we move on? You can actually keep, right, the, the chat stays open, so if, if a thought occurs to you and you want to fold in some thoughts, you should feel free. Um, to do that. Um, so what you're looking at is, is an image from um, one of the lesser known movements of the 1960s, a period that was full of movements, right, with the civil rights and the, environ just, excuse me, and the environmental justice and the women's rights movements. There was also simultaneously a widespread movement of poor women who organized through what was called the National Welfare Rights Organization. And one of the things that they brought attention to was the dilemma, the very particular dilemma that single mothers face. Right? No matter how much they might want to work, someone needs to care for their children. Now, it wasn't too terribly long ago when it was uh, the traditional perspective that women should be either obligated to be the ones who care for those children or to have the choice to do that. But here, Right? I mean, I think that, that, that what's curious is that we see a demand for welfare in order to care for their children that looks radical in its own way. But now, of course, one parent cannot both care for a child and simultaneously provide for the financial means to meet out that care, right? So that's why, in some ways, welfare, which used to be called mother's pensions can actually be a fairly conservative or traditional approach to solving very particular kinds of work and family dilemmas, right? And again, one of the things that I find throughout our history is that we've got poor mothers then and now who have asked, help me make it possible to care for my own children rather than pushing me out into the workforce 
and obligating me to pay somebody else to care for them. Right now, this is a dilemma that is not faced only by low-income women. It's, it's faced by arguably all families apart from the very wealthiest across the United States today. But it can be very difficult to accept assistance, right. even if there seems to be little choice. And very often, we hear women telling stories like the following one, in which the price of relief seems to be extracted in degradation and humiliation. Let's move on to the next slide. This is from Tanya not too terribly long ago. My first recognition of the stigma that, that poor single mothers face came with my initial visit to the welfare office in my third month of pregnancy. As I approached the reception desk, a clerk looked at my small, brown, and still not showing body and bitterly remarked, pregnant, I suppose. From there, it went downhill. During my screening, the caseworker sarcastically stated, I suppose you don't know who the daddy is stifled a laugh when I said I planned to finish my GED and go on to college, and glared at me when I told them that I refused to have my teachers, who did not yet know I was pregnant, sign notes for the welfare office stating that I was still in school and in good standing. To be frank, I was shocked. They felt that they had the right to hate me, to laugh at me, to disrespect me openly and blatantly because I was black and poor, because I was pregnant, and because I was alone. Now, this is a woman called Laverne speaking about 15 years ago. I don't know why life should be so hard. Life seems like I get on a boat and I get going and something happens and then I fall back again. I have to start all over again. And I get back in the boat and work hard and then something happens and I have to start all over again. It seems I never get anywhere, but, but I work real hard. The big question for me would be to figure out how I could get somewhere and stay there and keep going. But I don't know how to do that. I think for me part of the problem is that people underestimate how difficult so many people's lives are. We know, right, and we in this instance for me as a social scientist, we know that poor women are more likely to be disabled, more likely to be physically ill, and more likely to have mental health problems. They're much more likely to be caring for a sick or a disabled child. They are more likely to have suffered physical or sexual abuse as a child and more likely to have experience of abuse as adults. They tend to be less educated, which makes employment more difficult, not to mention the difficulty with less education of navigating what can be exceedingly complicated bureaucracies. But curiously, at least since the 1920s, we don't have good data before this, but we've got good enough data since the 1820s. The average time on welfare, this is what we used to call relief, it's been about 18 months. And usually women receive relief in between jobs to care for a newborn child or to care for a sick parent, to escape violence at the hands of a partner, or to finish school. So that is the... The data that we have available to us show that most women, in fact, wind up using welfare in ways that most people seem to think it should be used. Are there some who are lazy and who exploit the system? Yes, absolutely, of course there are. But there is no evidence that I am aware of that is more than a very small number. Most are engaged in a constant struggle, one that can seem as it does for Laverne, overwhelming. There's a very recent instance just from this fall. I am 28 years old. Though I now live with a loving partner who works as a public school teacher, I still identify as a single mom. I am a survivor of domestic violence, which left me temporarily homeless and often struggling to provide food for myself and my son. I've never been able to afford legal representation for escalating family law issues. I have a liberal arts BA and $10,000 in student loan debt. I don't have a credit card, which means zero in debt, but bad credit. I have not had health insurance since 2004, except for during my pregnancy. Cursed with genetically bad teeth, I haven't seen a dentist since 2004. I have struggled with chronic depression most of my life, but cannot afford mental health care. I can't afford new technology to continue dodgy freelance work or education to change careers. I'm not eligible for unemployment benefits. I'm in constant fear of scarcity and helplessness. 
These are not, in my experience, unusual complaints. But I want to draw your attention to that last line, in constant fear of scarcity and helplessness. That, in some ways, may be what poverty really is. It's not an income level, but a constant fear of scarcity and helplessness. Flawed character, right? It's more complicated than that, and I think almost always that's the case. Right, so here's yet one more perspective from another woman who escaped a violent relationship. Poverty becomes a vicious cycle that is written on our bodies and intimately connected with our value in the world. Our children need healthy food so that we can continue working, yet working at minimum wage jobs. We have no money for wholesome food and very little time to care for our families. So our children get sick. We lose our jobs to take care of them. We fall more and more deeply into debt because uh, uh, before our next unbearable job, and then we really can't afford medical care. The food bags we gratefully drag our exhausted children to on the weekend, hand out bags of rancid candy bars, past pulled dated hot dogs, stale and broken pasta, and occasionally a bag of wrinkled apples. We are either fat or skinny, and we seem always irreparably ill. Our emaciated or bloated bodies are then read as a sign of lack of discipline and as proof that we have failed to care as we should. Now, one of the tenets of the flawed character explanation is that poor people waste scarce resources. Now, sometimes poor people do, in fact, spend foolishly. But I want to offer just this very brief insight into why that might be. And this is from the Depression era. No one saves their money. A little money in these foolish young things buy a hat, a dollar for breakfast, a bright scarf. If you've ever been without money or food, something very strange happens when you get a bit of money, a kind of madness. You don't care. You can't remember that you had no money before, that the money will be gone. You can remember nothing but that there is money for which you have been suffering. Now there it is. A lust takes hold of you. You see food in the windows. In imagination, you eat hugely. You taste a thousand meals. You look in windows. Colors are brighter. You buy something to dress up in. And excitement takes hold of you. You know it is suicide, but you can't help it. You must have food, dainty, splendid food, and a bright hat. So once again, you feel blind, rid of that ratty, gnawing shame. So this is something that, that for me is, is useful to keep in mind when, for example, you hear complaints that poor parents waste money on expensive sneakers for their children, for example. It's really difficult to live in the contemporary world and to be surrounded by advertising that, that, that tells you the ways in which your self-worth and your children's self-worth and how they present themselves as being well cared for it's hard to hear all of those messages and resist them while all of the rest of the population is, of course, expected to follow them. Now, poor and homeless people, I think this is no surprise to anyone, can often be angered and outraged when they're stereotyped. Right? So here's um, what – so this is uh, from T, from the, the late 1980s. See, the first thing, they think that we're all bums. Next, they think we're criminals, am I right, or we're drug addicts. Or we're chronic alcoholics and don't mean no good to ourselves or anybody. Since we're homeless, they think there's got to be something thing wrong with us, you know? All right, here's another one that's very much in that vein. It would have been greatly to my advantage if I could have admitted to being an alcoholic or a drug addict. The social workers have no way of assisting someone who is sane and sober. My interview with the social worker made it clear that only three explanations of homelessness could be considered. Drug addiction, alcoholism, and psychiatric disorder. The more successful I was in ruling out one of these explanations, the more certain the other ones would become. Professional people like to believe this. They like to believe that no misfortune could cause them to lose their own privileged places. They like to believe that homelessness is the fault of the homeless, that the homeless have 
special flaws not common to the human condition, or at least the homeless have flaws that professional people are immune to. Right? I mean, even social workers and other professionals who are committed to offering assistance can be trapped into a flawed character kind of perspective and ultimately wind up pathologizing poor people. Ainer's experience is something you might well hear a lot from homeless men especially, many of whom do in fact have histories of addiction or mental illness, which can often be a consequence of post-traumatic stress disorder from their service in the military. But think about Ainer's explanation here, that it's a comfort to think about homelessness or poverty as a mark of special failing or of illness since that way, it can't happen to you. All right, so as we work our way to the end of this particular session, and we, we, we also get closer to being able to turn this back over to you all a little bit, um, note this. I'm 5'7 and 147 pounds. I live in the ghetto. I'm not supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a loser. I'm supposed to be on the 6 o'clock news shooting people's heads off. I'm supposed to be the one that you grab for your purse when I walk by. I'm the person that doesn't vote. I'm the person that is supposed to drink. I'm the person that is supposed to smoke weed. I'm the mother effort that is supposed to fill your jails. I'm the person that you make examples to your kid of what not to be like. I'm supposed to be a basketball player. I'm supposed to make it only because of affirmative action. I'm not supposed to be positive. I'm not supposed to be educated. I'm not supposed to know what I know. But I do. Right. So... Lee Allen here grew up to be the 2010 Green Party candidate for Senate in Illinois. And the quote, in fact, is from a book that was inspired by a radio documentary he made when he was 13 years old and living in the projects on the south side of Chicago. But his is not a typical story. Growing up in a poor neighborhood has negative effects on behavior, development, and the ultimate success of poor children. Asthma, diabetes, depression, and heart disease are more common, as are smoking and drinking. A poor child is three times as likely to drop out of school, twice as likely to give birth while a teenager, twice as likely to be sick, one and a half times as likely to have a learning disability, twice as likely to repeat a grade or to be expelled, and less likely to get that chance since she is twice as likely to die in infancy. And that, of course, is a constraint opportunity argument. All right, so let's go back to, to our friend Edith Wharton. Affluence, unless stimulated by a keen imagination, forms but the vaguest notion of the practical strain of poverty. Right, so let's bounce into the chat um, for, for a little bit um, and just ask folks to, to comment on, on this point as to, to any thoughts that are come across their mind, anything that they want to share. Um, I'll apologize, I'm probably not going to be able to see comments that have, have come that have scrolled by um, earlier in the presentation, but, but if there's something that you said earlier that you want to make sure you get in now, type it in now. Um, um, Terry, I like Terry Ann's comment very much, even as a vista, it's sometimes hard to remember what we're actually working towards. I think we'll talk about that um, a little bit toward the end. Um, what else? Anybody? Any, any observations at all? Don't be afraid to jump in. Right. Surely there must be some thoughts that you'd like to share, right? Or maybe not. Maybe it's, it's sort of this can be all a little bit of overwhelming at this point. Um, um, comment to Diana. Okay. So Linda's typing so good. She goes, and I didn't comment on this. She's having some of this one. So time. It is hard. I mean, I sort of I'm waiting for, for Linda to come in and respond to Diana before I sort of comment on what Diana there has to say. Um, I assume she's typing, and this can be a very awkward sort of thing, right? Um, you know, it's a dilemma, right? I mean, you've got limited amounts of, of hours and resources and time, um, and, and it can be very difficult to figure out how it is that you can be most effective. Right? So I don't understand for, for that at all. Uh, don't underestimate the difficulty of that at all. Sorry, I'm trying to talk and, and scroll through it once. All right, so, so what I'm going to suggest is that, that sort of think about comments. We're going to have other opportunities here for you all to jump in. Um, so why don't we tick on, um, and then we'll go back. Um, okay. So 
I want to now work, so we're working our way sort of toward the end here, and I want to try to bring some of these things together just a little bit in one way, right? There are a number of different ways that we can do that, but let's do this in the following way. All right, so take a look at the following poll. All right, this I think is, is, is interesting and encouraging, right? Showing how much support there is for trying to cut poverty in half. And this is fairly recent, right? This is only from 2008. All right, so we've got 76 people who either strongly or somewhat support efforts to cut poverty in half within the next two years, right? Now, the thing that I think is particularly interesting and curious is that if we think back to that survey we began with right, about people's explanations for poverty that often emphasized drugs or lack of effort or some of those flawed character explanations, this seems in its only kind of curious to me, right, how broad the support is nonetheless for doing something to, to eliminate poverty, right? And if we look at the next one, even when people consider the current economic crisis, right, a majority nonetheless support government action to assist people living in poverty, right? And one of the things that I think should be encouraging about that is that you are all obviously a part of that effort. And let's move on to the next one as well, because I think that this too can offer some hope. Like, notice how many Americans identify poverty as an issue that is or ought to be a concern to all of us, as something that's important enough that it affects all Americans. Right? And then let's put in this, this last one. Because right, part of the problem here is that, again, we've got to reconcile these kinds of uh, very positive expressions of support for intervening and, and doing things to reduce poverty with those, those kinds of flawed character explanations and the Big Brother explanations earlier. Right? Well, if you look at this chart, this, I think, helps us start to understand the complex ways that Americans tend to think about poverty and aid. And this, in fact, turns up over and over and over again in, in public opinion polls going back at least till the 1960s, is that it's, it's welfare, by and large, that people oppose. And, in fact, they support aid to the poor in very high numbers, but not if you call it welfare. Right? They think welfare is a big brother program for people who fit, fit that flawed character category. But as long as it's characterized as assistance to people who are poor through reduced opportunity, there's solid support from Americans to offer help. And I think that that, that may be useful information as you talk to Americans, to, to, to all sorts of, of Americans about other Americans who are living in poverty and the kind of work that you are doing. In fact, if we'll move on to the next slide, if, if people are telling pollsters the truth, they do more than simply worry about poverty and think that we ought to do something about it. They do, in fact, intervene to do something about it, right? 68% give money, 67% try to help an individual or a family, 42% have volunteered, right? Many of them you've no doubt met or will meet. Um, right? These broad representations across the population are in many ways your natural allies. All right, so as a bookend to Wharton, all right, let's um, end with this reflection. All right, and this is much more recent from, from a scholar called Michael Krumir Nebo. He writes that too often the voices and knowledge of poor people are perceived by policymakers and researchers as anecdotal, providing items to be used when introducing an article or lecture, but not as a source of knowledge necessary for the setting of policy or for the refinement of intervention methods. Their voices are regarded as mere noise, signifying nothing, or reflecting their distorted, unsophisticated, or irrelevant perceptions. The assumption is that people in poverty are to learn from the professionals and never the other way around. Right. So what I want to suggest in this context is to leave yourself open to the possibility, and I, I don't mean this in a superficial way, I mean this, this really in a rather deep way, that the people living in poverty who you are there to help are, in fact, the actual experts. Find ways to listen to them and to register their own perspectives and their own experiences and realize that there are some days when they will have much more to teach you than you will have to teach them. 
Poverty in America is complicated, and its causes and effects will vary a lot from place to place, from person to person, from family to family. It's always a good idea to learn as much as you can, but I think even with advancing knowledge, to always maintain some humility in the face of that kind of complexity. Right? So if you want to sort of read a bit more about what I have in mind, read a little bit more along these lines, we've got um, a short list of recommended readings that you'll be able to find on the VISTA campus, I believe, where that's going to be posted. Um, and um, Amy, do you want to jump in and then we'll turn over and we'll talk about what it is that's coming up next and then we'll make sure we'll open up a chat board and then we'll open up a phone line so that folks have an opportunity at this point to jump in um, and, and talk about what it is that we've been doing. Yeah, thank you, Stephen, so much um, for such a powerful presentation and I see that the chat panel has been uh, very active and folks have a lot to say. So at this point, we're about 10 minutes until the top of the hour, and so we have plenty of time for questions. Stephen's going to talk a little bit about what's coming up, and then we'll open up the, the phone line, and also you can also type your questions into chat. And we'll see if he's able to address some of the uh, conversations that have been happening in the chat um, as well at that time. So Stephen, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what's coming up next. Great. Um, and while I do that, for those of you who do have questions you want, you want specifically to, to lodge in my direction, uh, why don't you put those in and I'll ask Amy maybe to keep an eye on that. Um, and if there's anything that's been scrolling by that I haven't been able to pay attention to in chat, again, either Amy maybe if you want to draw my attention to something or if someone um, wants to, to pull me back to a conversation you all have been having, that would be great. All right, so um, this is the first of what we've got um, planned as three one-hour webinars coming up, and there are two more scheduled. Um, and I think Amy can talk to you about dates if those are formalized yet. And we've got um, a number of options available to them. The first, as you see, we're calling Who's Poor Today, What Every Vista Should Know. And this, in some ways, um, I'm thinking of as poverty literacy for Vistas. Right, so we'll go through, we'll offer a review of the most recent official poverty data, which just came out of the Census Bureau earlier this month. And the goal is for us just to get under our belts good understanding of how to describe poverty as it varies by age, by race, by gender, by geography, and to talk about how those patterns have changed over time. Right? We've got official data going back to 1959, so we can um, – look at, at what's happened over those decades and how poverty has, has affected different groups of Americans. And, and for that particular webinar, instead of, of using the kinds of first-person quotes that we use today to structure the discussion, we'll use um, a lot of sort of very simple charts and graphs so that it's easy for you to get a handle on, to see, to comprehend, and to remember what we all think are really important data and things that, for my money, you sort of ought to know what ought to know off the top of your head. Um, the second, poverty, crime, and criminal justice, is an effort to turn our attention particularly to the American prison population with attention especially to explaining why it is that such large percentage of prisoners were poor, unemployed, and less educated at the time of their arrest. We'll, um, among other things, we'll look at how the prison population has grown, what, prison po what prisoners have in common, um, and the impact that the criminal justice system has particularly had, not just on poor neighborhoods, but on poor neighborhoods of color. Um, the third proposal is making sense of the economic crisis. And if, you know, if you're trying to, to get your head around uh, what folks are calling the Great Recession and the continuing economic crisis that an awful lot of people are experiencing today, this is, this is sort of intended with you in mind. We'll look at um, trends in the economy over the last 30 years, um, to be sure, because I think we have to do that in order to make sense of what it is that's going on now. But we're going to home in particularly on current events, particularly so that when you pick up a newspaper, which, of course, you do each and every day, right, in order to get a sense as to what's going on in your neighborhood and what's going on in the nation and what's going on in the world, so that when you do that regular picking up of a newspaper, you've got a bit more knowledge so that you've got better understanding of the economic and the policy debates that are, are taking place constantly in national politics, certainly, and so that you have some sort of understanding of how they particularly affect poor, working class, and middle class Americans. 
Right, and finally, um, the proposal here is, is a history of private charity and philanthropy, um, paying particular attention to the ways in which not-for-profit kinds of service delivery has and hasn't changed over time, and some of the ways in which public and private policies have differed. And then lastly, um, and then Amy will say a few words about, about um, where you're going to be going in order to do this. If there is something poverty-related that you don't see here, but you think would be a good one-hour session of interest to some non-trivial number of other VISTAs, um, then we very much want to hear those kinds of suggestions from you as well. Um, and then we will we'll move forward. I think in relatively short order, um, take a look at what your all responses are and make some decisions about what we're going to be doing next. Um, so I think, Amy, it's, it's back to you for instructions of the survey, and then we'll open up the chat and the phone lines in the time that we have remaining. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Stephen. Um, thanks again for folks who joined us. And as I mentioned, um, Stephen will be able to stay on for some questions a little bit past the top of the hour if you have time to stay. If not, we understand you all are busy. Um, some instructions about what's next. So you will be able to vote on the next topic for the webinar. And you'll be able to do that by completing the survey, the evaluation survey, that will pop up on your screen once you close WebEx. Keep in mind that before our survey comes up, you'll see a survey from WebEx. That's optional. Uh, once you either complete that or close it, you'll see our survey, and you'll have a chance to vote on the topics for the next few webinars. We haven't set the dates for those yet, but we're expecting to um, offer those within the next couple months and through the new year. So um, keep an eye out on the VISTA campus for the exact date. So again, I just want to thank everyone. And I'm going to go ahead and unmute the phone. So if you um, be attentive to any background noise that might be happening in your area, and we can open it up for questions. Uh, Nikki, who's helping me moderate, is also going to be part of this conversation. So let me go ahead and unmute the phone line. Presentation mode is now disabled. Okay. Hello, everyone. Go ahead. Hello. So go ahead. Someone just jump in. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Tell me your name, please. Um, my name is Katie. Hi, Katie. How are I'm you? I'm in Los Angeles. I'm good. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of interested in knowing, like, I won I posted a question, but what what is your theory on this? Like. Instead of just aside from just the presentation, what are you? What are your thoughts about this? Like about, poverty. Thoughts about about what the causes of poverty are. Um. Yeah. Um. Or like, because you were saying some things that I've never really been. I was a social work student. Uh huh. And you were saying some things that like I haven't necessarily been taught. My um, prof my professors were like very adamant about poor people needing help and that kind of thing. But now it's like maybe you shouldn't help them because you're kind of preventing them from ever doing anything else besides relying on your support. Right. Well, I mean, I think. Um, um you know, I mean, obviously, that's sort of that's its own way a more complicated answer than we can do in, in the few minutes remaining. Um, yeah. Part of what we had all collectively, and me particular, and tried to do with this particular webinar is to highlight um, the very different kinds of ways in which people who are not poor have talked about poverty as compared to the way that people who are poor have talked about poverty. And okay. while you can absolutely find people who are not poor talking about restricted opportunities and, you know, social work professors very much at the forefront of that list, um, you can also simultaneously find poor people who will, you know, blame their neighbor for not trying hard enough and that's the reason that she's on welfare. But when you sort of put all of that together and you look at what the overall pattern is, what poor Americans overwhelmingly report is the kind of struggle, if you remember Laverne and that, that picture of sort of the, the boat lost at sea, um, of folks who have very often 
a very complicated array of life circumstances that make it often very difficult for them um, to, they can very often get their heads above water, but more typically the problem is keeping their heads above water, right? And in fact, if you look at data over time, this is something that we'll do if we do the, the poverty data, um, you'll see in fact that over the course of their lives, this, this, this I suspect will, you'll find very surprising, over the course of their entire lives, the majority of Americans are poor at least once. Right, official poverty rate is now about 15%. But if you look at how many people are ever poor for at least two months or more over the course of their lives, it tends to be about 60% or more. And in fact, what we see is the line between poor, working poor, working class, and middle class tends to be really quite fluid, in fact. And people over the course of their lives move in and out of that. Right now, does some of that happen because you know, in the 19th century, somebody comes, you know, a guy comes back from the factory and stops at the bar, stops at the tavern to cash his, his paycheck, and he drinks it all there, and the wife and children have no money, and they continue to live in poverty in the tenements. Yes, absolutely, of course, that happens. But that, by and large, if we look at explanations for poverty in the tenements of the 19th century or poverty up here in the Bronx in New York today, for my money, there tend to be much larger more daunting kinds of problems um, that get in the way. Is that, is, that, is that a reasonably satisfying kind of answer for that? Yeah. <laughs> you don't sound convinced. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just wondering, like, uh, aside from the presentation, what your views were on poverty. Well, you know, I, I mean, I think it's complicated. I think that, that, that you know, poverty is different for different people in different places at different times, and, you know, it's, it's, it can be different for the same family in different times, right? I mean, they can, you know, it's, it's, if you've got, you know, a, 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 a two-income household um, working, you know, relatively low-wage jobs but just barely managing to make it, and one of them uh, suffers an injury at work and they're not covered by disability insurance, right, they can almost instantly be plunged into poverty because they're not going to have a whole lot by way of savings. Three years down the road, if there's a divorce, right, and uh, the mother is left caring for the children herself, the source of the poverty there may be quite different, right? If, yeah. say, you know, three years after that, she suffers some sort of horrible trauma um, and develops a drug addiction, well, then we might have a different cause of poverty at that period. I know that, that, I mean, that in its own way is also fairly unsatisfying, but I really do think that it's complicated in those particular kinds of ways and it differs for different people at different times. All that having been said, part of what we're seeing right now in the moment we inhabit is extraordinarily high unemployment rates that make it very, very difficult for larger than normal numbers of people to cobble, cobble together enough income to keep a roof over their heads and to keep food on the table, right? I mean, that's sort of readily apparent in a lot of ways. But I'm trying really hard um, not to offer, offer sort of simple, easy, straightforward answers because I think most of the time those kinds of answers do an injustice to the complexity of what really winds up going Welcome on. Welcome to Verizon Wireless. Lives. The wireless customer you called is not available at this time. Please try your call again later. Hello? Announcements 1, switch Hello? 2, 2, dash Hi? 7. What's going on? Welcome to Verizon yeah. Wireless. The wireless well, customer you've got a question, just jump in. You've got Presentation mode is now enabled. Did we just mute everybody? What happened? Yeah, hi, folks. This is Amy, uh, your host. And I went ahead and muted the phone lines because we were having um, a significant amount of background noise. So um, at this point, I think um, probably our best bet is if you have specific questions for Stephen, you can go ahead and type those into the chat panel, and he can address those verbally. Um, I apologize we weren't able to have a two-way discussion, but as you all heard, there was uh, quite a bit of background noise happening. So does anyone else have specific questions for Stephen that you would want to put into the chat panel? Or is there anything, say, Nikki, if you've been looking through the chat, chat has it been going by, is there anything that maybe you think I, you should draw my attention to by way of... Absolutely. Hi, everyone. This is Nikki. There are a couple things that were, there was a lot of pretty wide-ranging and rich discussion going on in the chat, but a couple things that emerged as themes, and one that I think might be really important to address, there was some discussion about 
different feelings that folks had about their efficacy as VISTAs and, and mm -hmm. the ability they have in that role to address poverty, some folks feeling very empowered and other folks feeling um, that there are some limitations on what they can do in that role, and I think that might be something really interesting. Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and actually, I mean, I think that's, that's hugely important. Um, here's... Um, Here's the way that I think about that in, in, you know, in my own life and in my own professional work and in my own volunteer work and those sorts of things. Um, and that for me is informed by, um, you know, by my training as both a political scientist and an historian. If we look at how change has happened over time that, benefi that benefits poor and otherwise marginalized populations, change happens. Change absolutely happens. Right? There is no question about that. And change for the better happens, I suppose I should say. But it's slow, and it's difficult, and it's complicated. And I think, you know, all of us want to be able to go out and to, to exert our maximum efforts and to see something remarkable transpire in relatively short order. And I, I you know, I, I fight that urge myself. The, the reality is that that's an unreasonable expectation. Um, and I saw, I've been sort of looking through, I see there's some, some, been some sort of conversation about um, about social work education. It's, it's and, and I teach social work students here in New York. Um, you know, my experience is that if you've ever gone into to a welfare office or a public bureaucracy and you've met sort of this, this, this middle-aged caseworker who is the nastiest piece of work you've ever met in your life, um, and is, is surly and angry and unhelpful and is very often punitive toward the clients that he or she is working with. Um, my experience is that very often those people started out as idealistic and committed and determined to affect change and went out into the world with unrealistic expectations of how much change was going to be able to happen how fast. We live in an enormously complex world. We live in enormously complex political systems. We live in an enormously complex economy. We live in enormously complex social and cultural systems. And this is very unsatisfying and it's very unsexy. But I think part of, of what a good defense against that is, is to acquire as much sophisticated knowledge as you possibly can about how change has happened in the past, in the past and how to be effective at making change in the present but to realize that you're not going to remake the world overnight. So think perhaps in terms of short-term, medium-term, and long-term, right? Identify for yourself what is the long-term goal, right? Do you want to focus on questions of hunger? Is it income security? Is it disability among children? Um, is it food security, et cetera, et cetera, right? And sort of think about sort of long-term, what would you like to do? But start out with some, some, some manageable short-term explanations and realize that the mere fact that you all are doing what you're doing as VISTAs, even though it will feel, and some days it will feel like you're not doing anything and not making any difference, you are. Right? But it's not your work alone that you need to pay attention to. It's the work that you're doing and making progress for an individual, for a family, for a neighborhood, for a city multiplied by all of those other people in other places who are doing the same kind of work. And all of that work together accumulated over time is where change comes from. And, you know, I know that's right in some ways that's dispiriting, but I think that, that to expect too much too quickly, and I, I, I hope it's clear, I don't mean that the answer is to be cynical. I think the answer is absolutely to be hopeful, always. Change is always possible. Change is always desirable. Um, if you're looking to improve the quality of people's lives, but it's almost always very, very complicated and very, very difficult. But acknowledge that. Get over it. Realize, all right, this is going to be really hard, and it's probably going to be slow. So what are the little pieces that I can do to push this forward in my own way and recognizing that there are other people pushing things forward in their own kinds of ways? Thanks, Stephen. Um, Another question that came up a couple times very directly that I think it would be great if you could address, we still have a number of folks on the webinar, is um, the question of whether you have any examples or case studies of people living in poverty being involved in welfare policy planning. Sure, sure. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's, I, should, I, I shouldn't say sure quite that readily. Um, there are lots of examples of 
um, organizations um, of, by, and for people working um, to insert themselves into planning processes. And in fact, if you look at social work schools and public administration schools, there's, there's a growing body of work looking at that kind of participant planning, community planning um, models for more effective policy creation and policy delivery. There's an organization in New York City that I do some work with called Community Voices Heard, uh, which is very much built along that model. A lot of the work that the Bloomberg administration has done around poverty issues over the last number of years has been altered sometimes a little bit around the edges and sometimes significantly by those kinds of organizations of low-income folks, insisting that they be part of the process. Um, and, you know, in a lot of cities, to their credit, they're finding ways to open up those processes to that participation. Now, that's, you know, that's always difficult because, um, you know, the more people you have involved in decision-making, the harder it is to make decisions. And when you're getting the people who are actually affected by policies being involved in processes that they weren't involved in before, that's very disruptive to normal politics. So it very often takes time for agencies, for, for administrations, for organizations themselves to figure out right, what does this look like now that we're sort of expanding the number of stakeholders, to use that language. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's happening in little bits and pieces all over the country. It's not, you know, it's not sweeping the nation just yet, but I think more and more there's, there's a realization that, that that really can improve the quality of policies that get produced, right, by taking seriously the knowledge that, that the potential beneficiaries of it have. Thank you, Stephen. This is Amy uh, again, and mm -hmm. I just want to acknowledge that we're about 15 minutes past the end of the hour, and I want okay. to be aware of everyone's time. There has been some really rich discussion in the chat, and what I am going to encourage is that um, for our VISTAs to utilize the VISTA campus and to go to the VISTA forum and continue this discussion about poverty and the different, um, you know, share your opinions, debate it with your fellow VISTAs. I think it'd be great to bring in even more VISTAs into this conversation in the VISTA forums, which is exactly what those discussion boards are made for. So I encourage you all to do that. Um, the next steps for me, I will be sending you an evalu uh, I'm sorry, an email with the link to the evaluation. If you miss it once you close WebEx, you'll be able to click on that link as well. And then again, I urge you to continue the conversation using the VISTA forums on the campus. And I'll provide that link as well if, if you're not uh, familiar with where the forums are located. So with that, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up uh, for the day. We will be posting a recording of this session on the VISTA campus. I'll provide you that link as well in my email. And we also will be saving all this information from the chat and reviewing it with Stephen at a later date and kind of keeping it in mind as we move forward with this series. Yep. So I hope everyone uh, enjoyed the presentation today. This has been the most active webinar I've ever been on, and I'm really proud to see that people are thinking about poverty in uh, a deep way at this point in time. So thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, anything you want to say as parting thoughts? Um, thank you, Amy. Thanks to everyone out there for being here. And keep at it, yeah. right? Just it's, 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 you know, baby steps. Baby steps, right? Progress comes slowly. But, but um, the work that you're doing, it matters, and it matters profoundly. So, so keep at it. And I hope to, to see you folks again at the next webinars. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Bye now.